What is non-directive coaching? Non-directive coaching or counseling focuses on the following five aspects. It's a humanistic approach and major concept that people are generally trustworthy, resourceful, capable of self-understanding and self-direction, able to make constructive changes and able to live effective and productive lives. The person-centered approach focuses on the client being able to develop a greater understanding of self-environment, self-exploration and improved self-concepts. Self-exploration in this context means looking at your own thoughts, feelings, behaviors and motivations and asking why. It is looking for the roots of who we are, answers to all the questions we have about ourselves. For a successful coaching process, it also focuses the quality of the coach who needs ability of being empathetic, understanding in a non-judgmental way. The coach does not offer advices, directions and interventions. It is important to be clear that, in its purest form, the lack of direction applies both to the content of the conversation and also to the scope of the conversation, which leads both the coach and the client to a relationship that allows the client to resolve problems and helps the client to be able to make changes for themselves. All that bases on the client's responsibility for his or her life. As we know from the theory of personality, the humanistic influenced non-directive or client-centered approach has several key concepts. Most of them are the following. Self-actualization. People have the tendency to work towards self-actualization. Self-actualization refers to developing in a complete way. It occurs throughout the lifespan as the individual works towards intrinsic goals, self-realization and fulfillment, involving autonomy and self-regulation. Conditions of words refer to judgmental and critical messages from important people that influence the way the individual acts and reacts to certain situations. When an individual has conditions of worth imposed on him or her, the distance between real self and the ideal self is large which means there is an incongruity. Also, the individual is exposed to overprotective and dominating environments. A fully functioning person, according to Rogers, the closest the person's self-image and self-ideal are to each other, the more congruent and consistent and the higher the person's self-worth. Phenomenological perspective. The approach in which the focus is on the individual's direct reports of experience and their own world. Carl Rogers stated six sufficient conditions that are necessary for such a change. First, the coach client contact. A relationship between the client and the coach must exist and it must be a relationship in which each person's perception of the other is important. Second, the client's incongruence. Incongruence exists between the client's experience and awareness, or in other words, between the real self and the ideal self. This can also have a negative impact on the self-image. Third, therapist congruence. The coach is congruent within the therapeutic relationship. The coach is deeply involved, him or herself. They are not acting and they can draw 
on their own experiences to facilitate the relationship. Fourth, the coach's unconditional positive regard. The coach accepts the client unconditionally, without judgment, disapproval or approval. This facilitates increased self-regard in the client as they can begin to become aware of experiences in which others distorted their own way of self-worth. Fifth, the coach's empathic understanding. The coach experiences an empathic understanding of the client's internal frame of reference. Accurate empathy on the part of the coach helps the client believe the coach's unconditional affection for them. Sixth, client perception. The client perceives, to at least a minimal degree, the coach's unconditional positive regard and empathic understanding. Three of these conditions have become known as the core conditions. Rogers stated that the most important factor in successful coaching is the relational climate created by the coach's attitude to their client. He specified three related core conditions, congruence, unconditional positive regard and empathy. All the three aspects we mentioned in the slides before lead us to the question, what does it mean in particular in the process of non-directive coaching. Let's have a look on the distinction of direct and non-direct approach to the items. In non-directive coaching, the individual is the expert and he or she sets the agenda. The coach helps them to think through that agenda and then apply their own experience to active outcomes he or she wants. Non-directive coaching is facilitative. It is based on reflective learning and structured problem solving. The coach requires knowledge of how to help people explore and problem solve for themselves. Directive coaching on the opposite. The coach sets goals for the individual or group, suggests strategies to achieve those goals, identifies resources, monitors the performance of the individual or the group, and gives them evaluative feedback. The coach is the expert and tells the individual or group what to do. Directive coaching is instructional. It is another form of teaching or training. The coach requires expert knowledge of performance in the given context. Non-directive coaching has a strong focus on helping people to overcome self-limiting attitudes and assumptions. It does by this questioning those attitudes and assumptions in the context of practical problem solving. Without dwelling on why the client has made the assumption, non-directive coaching helps the client to recognize it as an assumption rather than a fact and see beyond it, showing a person that they are able and capable of problem solving provides concrete evidence of their capacity to explore and develop. The process can be divided in four parts or phases. First, there's the initial interview. It builds the relationship, clarifies the initial situation, clarifies the requirements, and enables the first psychological release. The second appointment explains the further process defines rules of the game and targets and objectives. In the further process, there is accompaniment, empathic understanding, non-judgmental feedback and the encouragement of self-exploration.
And finally, the concluding interview consists of evaluation, controls and transfers, and further contacts. The kind of help can be reflected into alias several techniques of non-directive coaching. For an example, there are six. First, attentive listening. To be helpful, the coach needs to understand the client. The coach gains that understanding by paying close attention to what the client is saying and how they are saying it and what they are not saying. Attentive listening requires the coach to suspend judgment, put aside any agendas, including helping agendas, and questioning their own assumptions, as well as clarifying and summarizing by the coach to confirm their understanding. It includes giving the client time and acknowledging their feelings. For example, the emotional content of what the client is saying. It is the skill and foundational technique of non-directive coaching. Second, purposeful non-directive, non-judgmental questioning. In non-directive coaching, it is both an extension and a development of active listening. It is non-directive and non-judgmental, but always purposeful. Its single aim is to help the client achieve their objective. To that end, questioning focuses closely on what the client needs to do, how they are going to do it, when they are going to do it. The coach's only goal is to understand what the client says. Questioning helps the client by giving them the opportunity to talk through what they are trying to do to someone who takes a genuine interest in their success, beliefs, in their ability, knows how to keep them on track and never tries to tell them what to do. Third, constructive challenge. Constructive challenge supports the client to move forward. It can range from asking the client to identify more options or reconsider the meaning of an experience, to refocusing the client on their objective or holding them to account for commitment they have made. It helps the client to develop awareness and take responsibility, but always supportively and on the client's own terms. Fourth, confidence building reassurance and affirmation. By combining attentive listening and purposeful non-directive, non-judgmental questioning with constructive challenge, non-directive coaching reassures and affirms to the client that they have it within them to achieve their objective. When the client expresses self-doubt, the coach offers reassurance, explicitly stating their confidence in the client's capability. When the client makes progress, however minor it may be, the coach points out this progress and helps the client to connect to their own efforts. Fifth, motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing can be divided in four steps of progress. Engaging. Engaging is used to involve the client in talking about issues, concerns and hopes and to establish a trusting relationship with a counselor or coach. Focusing. Focusing is used to narrow the conversation to habits or patterns that clients want to change. Evoking. Evoking is used to elicit clients' motivation for change by increasing the client's sense of the importance of change, their confidence about change and their readiness to change. Planning. Planning used to develop 
the practical steps clients want to use to implement the changes they desire. Sixth, cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring involves four steps. First, the identification of problematic cognitions known as automatic thoughts, AGs, which are dysfunctional or negative views of the self, the world, or future based upon already existing beliefs about oneself, the world, or the future. Second, identification to the cognitive distortions in the ATs. Third, rational disruptions of ATs with the Socratic method. And fourth, the development of a rational rebuttal to the ATs. Mm-hmm.